September has always been my favorite month, and it's not just because I was born in it. <clears throat> I love the start of a new school year. You guys seen that commercial lately, the, the two kids doing homework and the power goes out but their computers stay on, right? And the boy says, wow, look at that, power goes out and we can still do our homework. And the sister looks at him and says, and that's a good thing? He says, it's a great thing for me. And she says, who are you? Yeah, I was that boy. <laughs> I loved school. I loved the beginning of a new school year, all that brought about. I love the change of seasons. I love the colors of fall. I, I really resonate with the person that says, my favorite color is October. I like that. Uh, I love the, the change of the seasons. The cooler weather, oh, thank you, Lord. Um, all that that brings. Now, some changes we like. You know, I like the, change, the transition from summer to fall. We go from the blistering heat and humidity to the cooler weather. From winter's chill to spring, we like those changes. We're not so thrilled about the changes from fall to winter, or maybe from spring to summer. Change is an aspect of life that we can anticipate. Sometimes we welcome the change, sometimes we dread it, but it is inevitable. Often the hardest changes are the ones that are unexpected, those things that are out of our control, an economic recession, a global pandemic, a major disaster, or it might be more personal, a personal illness, a loss of a job, a loss of a home, as many people have experienced here lately. Changes of this magnitude can be difficult to come to terms with, but you'll often find that your experience of them can be either made better or worse, depending upon how we react, depending on our attitude towards that. I mean, let's face it, human nature abhors change. We don't like it. There's even a joke about it. The only person that likes change is a wet baby, right? We don't like change. And yet, from another perspective, we can't live without it. The fact is, our bodies and our brains need a certain amount of stress to keep us moving, growing, and adapting. Now, I realize we talk a lot about stress in the negative. Too much stress is, is not good for us, but we all have to have some. We all have to have some challenges that get us out of bed in the morning. We need things that will spur us on. Otherwise, our, our muscles would atrophy and our brains would turn to mush. In some ways, the only constant in our world is change. But sometimes coping with change can be a real challenge. To the 21st century man or woman on the street, life looks, looks more like a puzzle. Change is so constant, it tends to dominate contemporary thinking more than anything else. Most persons today feel like their culture has become so, so fluid, so, so uh, almost plastic-like, where, where you can bend it and form it and twist it and shape it. And they feel like they're constantly being pulled by the changes going on around them. And most people don't like it. Now, Christians are not immune to change. Christians are not immune to disliking change either. So for this month of September, I'd like to address the topic, Coping with Change. And in doing so, I want to consider four questions that at one time or another we may be facing in our lives. Number one, what is happening with my culture? We're going to look at that this morning. Then what is happening with my church? What is happening with my children? And then finally, what is happening with my condition? We begin with the alarming rate of cultural change. 
Now, I remember when I was growing up, I would hear people that I considered old saying things like, boy, as time goes on, or as as you get older, time goes faster. And I remember thinking to myself, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. How can time go faster? It just, that doesn't even make sense. I'll tell you what, I am one of those saying that now. I'm one of those old people saying, the older you get, the faster time flies. Because it's true. I can't explain it. It doesn't even seem logical, but it is a fact. Time does go faster. I think it's because of the rate of change is so quick. Things change so fast, it's hard to keep up with, and it's hard to keep track, frankly, of one day to the next or one week to the next. Early in the 1960s, Thomas Kuhn gave this drastic change of perspective a name. We now call it a paradigm shift. I thought a paradigm was, you know, shoving 20 cents across the table. Well, never mind. This occurs when a scientist or a researcher can't make sense of their data using conventional perspectives. Uh, They try to figure out what to do with all of this data that they've collected. They, They use all of the usual ways of looking at it. None of it fits. And they have to come up with a completely new outlook, a new perspective. And that's hard. That's hard to do. You start out by thinking, am I crazy for thinking this way? I mean, has nobody else ever looked at it like this? And if that's the case, am I the one that's wrong? (laughs) And oftentimes when we try to suggest a new perspective, other people will tell us that we're wrong. So that reinforces that feeling. It takes real persistence and, and just believing in this new, this new paradigm in order for people to finally understand. I find three areas in which the rate of cultural change is alarming to many of us. First of all, we see changes in information And the amount of it is overwhelming. I think it's a huge challenge in our culture today. We have access to so much information, much more so than generations past. I remember hearing that when a new science textbook is written, by the time it's published, it's already out of date. Because things change so much in the realm of science. Of course, now nobody uses textbooks anymore, but, you know, at one time that was a thing. I'm reminded of what the Bible says in Daniel 12, 4. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of this scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Boy, isn't that the truth today? It just seems that Knowledge is all around us, and it, it's, it's hounding us. It, it's coming in on us. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by it. Our access to this information threatens to bury us. Back in 1980, when Cable News Network first aired, it's now it's called CNN, it was the only 24-hour news channel. There are now 70 of them. Where 24 hours a day, you are being told what is happening all over the world. Why is that so important? Well, our culture tells you that knowledge is power. But that much knowledge can be overwhelming. And now the integrity of the information that's been broadcast comes into serious doubt. We don't know who to trust. Again, I'm reminded of Scripture. In 1 Timothy 6.20, Paul instructs, turn away from godless chatter 
and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. (laughs) Fake news isn't new. It's been going on for a long, long time. But we've got to be careful now. We, We have to try to sift through what is factual and what is propaganda, even when we're watching the nightly news. It can be overwhelming. Further, we see changes in invention, and the acceleration of it can be overwhelming. Technology is changing on a daily basis. Things that were unheard of 20 years ago are now commonplace today. And right about the time we get that computer or cell phone or smartwatch figured out, they've come out with a newer one, which of course isn't compatible with the old one. And you got to start all over learning it again, right? That can be overwhelming. But most disturbing to Christians, I think, we see changes in iniquity, and the acceptance of it is overwhelming. What was kept hidden a generation or two ago is now flaunted openly, and those who don't endorse it are vilified. You're a hater, you're intolerant. You're out of touch. Now this should not surprise us at all because the Bible predicted it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People, People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Hit it right on the head. And elsewhere he writes in Romans chapter 1, he talks about the downward spiral of humanity. At the end of that chapter, after going through a, a litany of, of sins and evil that just progress, he says, although they knew God's righteous decree that those who deserve, that do these things deserve death, They not only continue to do these very things, but approve of those who practice them. We have a culture today that is applauding all of the evil that is now being called good. And on the flip side, good is being called evil. That's alarming. And it leaves a lot of us wondering, what are we supposed to do? In fact, the alarming rate of cultural change leads to an anxious reaction for many. Changes can be challenging, but they can also be threatening. To a person who hasn't kept pace with recent trends in the area of whatever their uh, specialty might be, a shift of focus can be very unsettling. You feel like the workplace has passed you by. You feel like life has passed you by. If you find your skills to be dated, you can find a variety of emotions surfacing. Anxiety, frustration, disappointment, anger, depression, even despair. There's even a psychological diagnosis for those for whom change creates such stress, it interferes with their ability to fully function in life. It's called adjustment disorder. And I'm sure if somebody hasn't gotten a pill out for it, they will. Even if the change is positive, maybe you've got a new job, maybe you're moving into a new house, maybe your family has a new baby. That's stressful. That's change. And it can bring about a lot of anxiety. That may not be true for everyone, especially to the point of a psychological diagnosis. Some people embrace change as fun and exciting, a new challenge to be met head on. 
why then is it that so many of us resist change? I thought a lot about this, this, preparing this message. Why are we so resistant to change? And I think I understand it. Most of us are comfortable with the familiar. We like the familiar because it's predictable. We know what's coming. Now, I know sometimes we complain that we feel like our lives are stuck in a rut, but most of us enjoy routines, right? We're creatures of habit. How many of us eat pretty much the same thing for breakfast in the morning? Right, routine. How many of us have certain clothes that we like to wear? They're comfortable, right? How many of us sit in the same pew Sunday after Sunday after Sunday? All right. Cross the line from preaching to meddling, right? <clears throat> but it's true. We are comfortable with the familiar. And the reason why is because we feel more in control. I feel like I know what's coming. And so I can mentally anticipate and prepare for it. Even when it's negative, it may not be the best option out there, but at least we know what to expect. We see this is true in relationships. You take a child of an alcoholic father. When she grows up, oftentimes she'll be attracted to alcoholic men. Why? Because it's familiar. It's not good, but it's familiar. You take a child from an abusive home, and they often gravitate towards abusive people. Why? Because they know what to expect. And that's why it's hard to leave such a situation, because you're going to go into the unknown. At least I know what's coming, and I can prepare for it. And I think that's why a lot of us are resistant to change. I think that's why change causes anxiety in a lot of us, because we don't know what's coming. We don't know what to expect. What if it's even worse than what I'm experiencing right now? So everything within us cries out for some kind of stability, some perspective from which we can evaluate what's going on in this constant flux and change. When we're constantly facing change all around us, we tend to react with anxiety and fear. So what can we do about it? The alarming rate of change in our culture shows no signs of slowing down. There's no practical way of pretending that it isn't so. And yet, we're commanded in Scripture, don't worry about anything. Fear not, right? So how do we do that in the rapid change that's going on in our culture? One author put it this way, change generates uncertainty. Therefore, focus attention on on increasing the level of trust by highlighting the points of assurance rather than the dramatic nature of change. What's he saying there? Instead of focusing on all the changes going on around you, focus on something that's stable. And so I want to conclude this morning with some assuring reminders amid cultural change. Once again, I believe God's word speaks right into our situation with words written thousands of years ago. The first is in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes comes right after Psalms and Proverbs in your Old Testament. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I want to remind us that while specific things change, the basics of life do not. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. 
The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south, then turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. That last verse really jumps out at me. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. I think about that every time I think I come up with a new idea. Wow, this is fresh. This is new. I'll bet no one's ever thought of this before. And then I'll find somebody thought of it 20 years ago. Nothing new under the sun. People say, oh, we've never lived through times like these. Oh, yes, we have. History constantly repeats itself. Why? Because, number one, human nature doesn't change. Number two, part of human nature is that we're kind of dumb and we don't learn from our mistakes. (laughs) So we keep doing things over and over again. Like he said, what's been done will be done again. You know? Any of you have children, you understand that, right? Things really don't change. How about this analysis of human nature? When the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Doesn't that sound like today? Doesn't it sound like humanity? Always evil all the time. You know when that was written? Genesis 6. This is before Noah built the ark. And guess what? Human nature hasn't changed all that much. Oh, technology has, no doubt. But I think technology has only made us more efficient in our evil. We can kill more people faster than they could back then. But the inside, what what makes humanity who we are, hasn't really changed. Now, that fact may not be very reassuring, (laughs) But here's one that is. When change is all around us, our God does not change. Our God does not change. Consider Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? No. Our God does not change. This is echoed in 1 Samuel 15, 29. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. We do not have a fickle God who says, eh, I don't think I want to do it that way anymore. Let's change. Our God is the same. The clearest declaration of this is in Malachi 3, verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. You can't get any clearer than that. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. That's God's way of saying, I don't change, and it's a good thing for you that I don't. Because if I did, I'd probably wipe you off the face of the earth. Right? God doesn't change. Psalm 102 gives a beautiful picture of this. Psalm 102, beginning in verse 25. In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain They will all wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them and they will be discarded, but you remain the same. Your years will never end. The children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established 
before you. Here's a great promise. Our God does not change. His promises do not change. We see this also in the New Testament. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Hebrews 13.8 adds, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. He does not change. This is how we can focus our attention on points of assurance rather than on the dramatic nature of change. It's like Peter out there walking on the water, right? When he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was fine. When he started looking around him at the winds and the waves, he began to sink. When we focus our attention on the winds of change, we're going to be unsettled. We're going to begin to sink when we keep our eyes on Jesus. He doesn't change, and we stay on top of things. As our scripture reading instructed us, be still and know that I am. In the original Hebrew, that word God wasn't there. Be still and know that I am. That's, that's God's name. I am that I am. I will be what I am today. I've always been what I am today. God does not change. And we can be still in that knowledge. Instead of allowing the rate of change to overwhelm us, we can be calm in remembering that our God does not change. So I want to conclude this morning with three concepts that can help us when we wonder what's happening with my culture. First, don't fear the prospects of the new. Not every invention that comes out comes from the laboratory of hell, okay? Not everything new that comes out is the mark of the beast, Sadly, that's the way the church has viewed a lot of new technology, and we've lost opportunities to reach people. When radio first came out, and the church was approached and said, look, you can broadcast the word of God into places that won't otherwise hear. Many of the church leaders said, oh, but Satan is the prince of the power of the air, meaning airwaves. Oh, we can't use that. That's of the devil. Everything that comes out, oh, that's of the devil. No, it's not. You just don't like change. You don't like things new, let's face it. So don't fear the prospects of the new. Some things actually are better. At the same time, don't fall for the promises of the new. <laughs> just because it's bigger doesn't make it better. Just because it's faster doesn't make it superior. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's improved. Remember that? It seemed like every other commercial, new and improved. Uh, not necessarily. We shouldn't naively accept everything we hear on the network news, everything we hear from the world of science, and maybe nothing we hear from politicians. I don't know. As Abraham Lincoln said, just because you see it on the Internet doesn't mean it's true. At least that's what the Facebook post I read said. <clears throat> Finally, don't forget the permanence of the Lord. The power, the presence, the promises of God do not change. We find comfort in the familiar because God does not change. His principles and precepts on right and wrong do not change. His love, his grace, and his mercy do not change. We can trust him completely. Even if we can't trust anyone or anything else, we can trust him because he does not change. Change in and of itself is unavoidable. 
it can be uncomfortable because it disrupts what we think we can control. Change reminds us that we're not nearly as in control as we would like to be. Our challenge is to live in humble obedience to the Lord, accepting what we cannot change, and living to please Him. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, we make it our goal to please Him. That also does not change.